All right, we're going to get started. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, I don't believe because there was no school. The ROTC is probably not here. So we'll just have everybody rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. All right, we'll go right into the host school presentation. Principal Jay Seleski, if you could come up and uh, we'll introduce, J this is Jay Seleski, the principal of McCons Elementary. Yeah. Welcome, thank you for everyone uh, braving the uh, winter conditions. It's great to see everyone out here at McCons Elementary. My name is Jay Seleski, the building principal. Uh, we're very privileged to have been chosen as tonight's location for this meeting. Our elementary consists of uh, over 300 students that provide a determined and focused work ethic on a daily basis to empower themselves for academic growth. We have over 40 staff members with that to come to work each day committed to provide all students with a positive experience and strive to push them academically towards mastery. The staff impresses me daily with their team collaboration mentality and their willingness to constantly put students first. We value and engage in many opportunities that students are offered after school to help them grow academically, athletically, emotionally, and socially, such as Girls on the Run, a science club run by Mr. Ty Green, one of the teachers of the year, math tutoring, an ESL tutoring, and also an after-school rec club. We also take pride at McCants to involve all stakeholders within our community and provide opportunities outside the normal school hours, such as back-to-school bash, holiday celebration night, family game night, and much more. Without the positive supports of our parents, staff, and many volunteers within our community, we'd never be able to host these fun-filled events for our students and their families. So I'd like to say thank you to all of you that are in this public forum tonight. Before we turn it over to the regular meeting agenda, I thought it would be extremely beneficial for all of you to hear from one of our second grade students who embodies our growth mindset here at McCants. We offer the growth mindset mentality in every classroom daily using provided resources and mantras of the month. This program helps our students thrive and grow together with a common theme. So without further ado, I would like Aaliyah McCauley and her teacher, Ms. Griffin, to come on up. I am Aaliyah. I am Aaliyah McCauley, and I am seven years old, McCants Elementary, second grade, Ms. Griffin's class. She wants everyone to have a growth mindset, not a fix. And so today, that is what I will be telling you about. Change your mindset. You should always have a growth mindset. Here are different kinds of growth mindsets. I can try a different math strategy. I can, can I succeed if I try? I'd like to be challenged. If I use good stamina, can I get better? And I won't give up. Here are some fixed mindsets. I give up, this is good enough, I don't need stamina, I can't improve, and I don't need help. I believe you should always have a growth mindset, not a fix. Each month, there is a mantra, and this month of February is a goal without a plan is just a wish. That means if you are trying to get better, like you're trying to get better at math, you need you need to have a plan to get better. But if you don't have a plan, you're just wishing to get better. So that's why you have to have a plan to get better of your goal. Here are some good questions that you can ask. You can ask, how can I get better? What is my plan to try to get better? And now I'm going to tell you about the two kinds of praise, a person pray and a process pray. A person pray is when someone says, you are a natural at math. It sounds nice, but it's actually like a fixed mindset. 
Here, here's what you can say. Here is a kind of process, a, a process pray. It is when you say, can I improve? Again, nice, but don't worry. It is like a growth mindset. Here is the different kinds of person praise. You don't need practice. You are a natural. Work hard for good grades. Never say these things. Again, they are nice, but they are like a, gro a fixed mindset. Here are the different kinds of process praise. Good math strategy and work hard and have fun. You can say these things. These things are really important to help students to grow, to make their ma brain grow, and they can help them have a growth mindset, not a fixed. Is there any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you for that wonderful presentation. That was awesome, Aaliyah. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Selesky. All right, go into the Teachers of the Year presentation. Bring up uh, this Terry Wedge here. Who's going to do the uh, elementary? Joe? Oh, he's three. Well, someone want to step in? Oh, all right. Oh, what timing, Joe? That's right. What's that? Okay. No pressure, Joe. <laughs> okay, good evening. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the 2020 Teachers of the Year. Um, and I'd like to just say to all the nominees, uh, it's just awesome to be nominated uh, with uh, such a large group of great teachers that we have. Um, and this year, we'll start with our elementary winner, and that is Todd Green. Uh, just tell you a little bit about Todd. Todd's been with us for since uh, 99, 21 years, many of which he's uh, been a first grade teacher. Currently, he's uh, in three buildings as a STEM technology teacher. Um, and he makes uh, sure that the kids are always engaged and having funny, fun. Todd, we got a little bit more to, t to you, you, you. Don't be in such a hurry to get off the stage. Okay. Um, but outside the classroom, Todd um, participates uh, and often takes the lead in many events like field day, uh, the Summer Foreign Culture Camp. He also attends music concerts, extracurricular activities. He served um, as a host family for the culture, uh, Foreign Culture Camp as well. He's very kid-centered. And all three building principals talked about him as being a team player, uh, a leader, and being involved um, in, in many ways. Um, I want to share with you I think the best part when I was reading through Todd's stuff is the, the student quote. And the student uh, said, Mr. Green can be really funny, and he uh, puts together good projects that are fun, like forces of flight. We build structures that have to go against a leaf blower thing. In second grade, we had to build a strong enough house uh, structure that we used uh, a vacuum thing to blow it down. That was really fun. That was from a third grader. So congratulations to Todd.
For middle school, I'd like to introduce Danette Simon. I'm going to read a little bit about Danette. Um, Danette's been with the district. Is Danette here? Danette, come on in. <laughs> Danette's been with us for, um, in, the, uh, in the district for 16 years and shows a tremendous commitment to our district, most importantly, her students. Currently, she's teaching sixth grade uh, ELA at North. Some of the highlights about Danette is she serves as a district curriculum council member. She serves on the PBIS committee, the MTSS committee, part of the cardiac response team. I mean, there's nothing that Danette wouldn't do. Um, and also, she's served as the NHS advisor for five years. Uh, that they were in a lot of community service projects. Um, she's seen all over at different events. Um, the Nets uh, student quote uh, is, Miss Simon has a caring heart. She helps her students and is spontaneously smart. <laughs> he also, uh, she also, uh, no, he also said her challenging tasks and encouraging words push me to be the best I can be. That was from Kate Pilgrim. Congratulations. And our high school winner is Denise O'Hearn. Den Denise teaches government and AP government at the high school. She's also a curriculum council member. She uh, represents us at, at, with the Macomb County uh, Social Studies Council. She's also a National Honor Society advisor. She also coaches the mock trial uh, team and has produced three state finalists, finals, finishes. She's also a member of the PBIS uh, member and a mentor teacher to um, student teachers and also new Anchor Bay teachers. Uh, just a little uh, different uh, thing to share with you is Denise recently challenged her students to do 100 acts of kindness towards others in the community in spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. These acts of ki kindness are displayed in the commons at the high school, and Denise and her students' acts of kindness will be featured in a national publication, Atlantic 57. Um, I believe that's coming out soon. Yeah. Already has, okay. And uh, her student quote here is, Miss O'Hearn is one of the most inspiring, hardworking teachers I've had at Anchor Bay. She taught me everything I needed to know about government and politics, all while making sure that we succeeded on our AP tests. That was from Aaron Johnson. Congratulations. All right, congratulations to all of our Teacher of the Years from all the from elementary, middle, and high school, and let's give them one more round of applause for all three of them. <laughs> all right, at this time, uh, after the last meeting, when the and recently the JRLTC uh, investigation uh, was released, the report, uh, Mr. Woodside and the administration have made some. Uh, uh, changes, I would say, coming out of that report. So he's going to give a brief presentation here on uh, the results of it and uh, what he's put in place since then. Before we want to take a break so we can have the cookies. cookies. Oh, I keep forgetting about the cookies. Uh, my bad. To celebrate the Teachers of the Year, I apologize. We have cookies over there, so we'll take a brief five-minute break to uh, have some cookies uh, with the uh, Teachers of the Year. All right, we'll bring the board meeting back to order. Uh, like I said, we'll start off with uh, Mr. With Superintendent Woodside is going to give a, like I said, a brief update on the uh, JRLTC investigative report and then what uh, changes he came out of it. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, what I wanted to briefly share now and then under superintendent comments, I can go into more detail, but the most important thing is we do have the Air Force did post the position to Get our second instructor. You got to hold it. And they, we they, plan they, on. Yeah. And we plan on. They can't uh, hear you. You got to hold it up to your mouth. Yeah, I've never been accused of. Can you hear me? There you go. There okay. Go. <laughs> so, um, 
And we plan on having the second instructor in place. You, you, you got to have it close to your By the end of March. Just pretend like you're Eminem. You know? No? Yeah, you're dating yourself. <laughs> um, so we're looking forward to that. And we have met as administrators and with Sergeant Quintana and talked about, you know, the changes that we're going to make uh, going forward. And I know um, Todd has one of those changes that we're going to review with the board. All right. Do I drop it now? That dropped the mic, I guess. All right. Now we'll go into the budget update with Todd. Okay. As a part of our budget update this evening, one of the things we wanted to do is kind of update the board a little bit on where we stand right now with our teacher negotiations. And this is primarily with respect to our top step teachers. You may remember we signed a TA agreement uh, back on August 26th with our teachers for a step increase. And uh, we agreed to move the uh, top step teachers to negotiation after the School Aid Act had been signed into law. So we want to update board that this is a, a teacher negotiation page that has been added to the um, and I'm actually where was it that? oh there you go um, so need if you wouldn't mind going to the web page so you'll be able to find this web page um, right on the on the anchor bay website and what we've done there is we've, we've provided a lot of information and the reason for this is primarily transparency we want everyone to understand exactly what has been offered, where we stand today, and uh, we will continue to update this as more information comes out. We will continue to provide more and more information about this. Again, the whole idea here being as transparent as we can with both our teachers, our community, and the Board of Education. So on the transparency page, like I said, you'll find the you can stay there for just a moment, Anita. Um, on the transparency page, you'll find our tentative agreements that have been uh, reached. You'll also find district as well as ABA proposals that have gone back and forth for a top step. Um, we've also provided uh, some a sample of Anchor Bay teacher movements, so we'll talk about that a little bit in just a moment. But that's there for all to see. And then finally, we have some comparison charts that show how we stack up and, and the increases and so forth that we've had relative to some of the other districts here in Macomb County. Also there shares um, the, the different uh, step schedules that are available at each of the different districts. So this is really one place you can go and kind of get a lot of information about what's going on right now. Okay, Anita, if I can have you slip, flip back. So recent, one of the things before we get too far along here, wanted, there's recently been some misinformation regarding the top step negotiations with the teachers union. And in an effort to address that misinformation, I want to pull together a quick uh, slideshow here and provide some information. Um, we've created, as I said, the district webpage, with, which will help. Um, with that transparency. Um, I also want to say though that you know our teachers do an amazing job here at Anchor Bay. We're very proud of what our teachers do here at Anchor Bay and we're very committed to reaching a financially responsible agreement with our teachers here at Anchor Bay. Uh, we believe that they're worth every penny they're paid and they're probably worth more than that but it is the responsibility of administration and the board make sure that any proposal or any agreement that we reach is both financially responsible and sustainable into the future. So with that, I, not, not right now, no. So one of the, a couple of the misinformation that is out there is that the district only provided one top step offer, and we're gonna go into that and talk about that. But as actually the district provided four top step offers, and we'll go through those so everyone can understand what those are. 
Additionally, there's some misinformation out there that the district was the one who forced teachers to wait for a settlement until the passage of the State School Act. We'll be happy to talk to that as well, and uh, we'll go into that. Finally, um, I want to speak to the fact that Anchor Bay teachers at the top step have received no increases in the last 10 years. That's one of the misinformation that is out there. Fact is that they have actually re in received increases, and we are hopeful that we will be able to provide additional increases as well. So with that, if I can have you flip, Anita, to the next page. Let's go back to the teacher negotiation webpage for a moment. Under the uh, proposal area, if you can, thank you. You'll see starting on uh, October 21st, you can see there that you know the ABA came with their first proposal. And I'm not sure I need you to click into every one, Anita. Um, I just kind of want to highlight. Do you want to? All right, all right, and that's fine. So uh, the first proposal that came forward from the ABA was a 5% increase. I'm just going to go forward because I know what they are. It was a 5% increase on scale. That was re rejected by the district, and we came back on November 7th with a offer of 2% on scale, uh, off scale, I'm sorry, off scale, 2% off scale for our top teachers. The reason we came out with such an aggressive offer based on our financial situation, which we'll also talk about in just a moment, um, the reason we came out with such an aggressive offer of 2% off schedule right out of the gate, rather than kind of stretching it out and negotiating one half percent, one percent, two percent. We wanted to get our teachers, our top step teachers, their money as quickly as we could. We wanted to put it in your hands as quickly as we could. Um, the decision was made by the board to come with a very strong offer so that we could provide that information. Okay, and uh, that was rejected and later, uh, the we came back with the same offer of a 2% off schedule. That was rejected, and then there was another proposal that was brought by the ABA, and then at that point, that offer was rejected, and the district came back with their third offer of 2% off schedule. Finally, on January 23rd, the district came back with its final offer, and if you could pull that up, I would appreciate it. We came back with our final offer of 2% off schedule and 1% on schedule if the enhancement millage passed. Not right now. You're going to have your chance to speak right after this is over. The ABEA's initial offer prior to that was an offer uh, and and I don't I, mean, I apologize we can't get these to come up but on January 14th the ABA came with an offer of 2% off schedule 2% on schedule for the 2021 school year if the enhancement millage passed so importantly we are really only one percentage point apart if the millage passes. That's the only difference separating their final offer from our final offer. We uh, believe that that's a very generous offer. We also know that you know, there's a reopener to come back in August. There's a reopener where we can sit down and we can continue to negotiate with the ABA. So that 2% was hope, we hope to get that into the hands of our teachers and then come right back in August and renegotiate again. So um, just wanted to clear up that misperception and then we'll move on to the next misperception. The next, the next slide talks to the fact that it was only the district that wanted to delay or defer uh, the top step to after the passage of the State School Aid Act. On August 15th, there were actually two proposals that were passed. One of the proposals came from 
the district in which we suggested that we would wait for the State School Aid Act to pass before we would provide any sort of increase to top step teachers. Second, and then the second uh, proposal came back from the ABA later that day on August 15th, about three hours later, they came back and they also, in their proposal, you can see very clearly that they're also tying top step teacher compensation to the passage of the State School Aid Act. So really what was happening there, and this is how oftentimes many of the uh, agreements are reached in that collective bargaining process, is that both sides sit down, they discuss, they talk about things, and oftentimes those things make their way into the proposals. And so, you know, you'll remember on August 26th, the ABA actually sat down, ratified a agreement with the district agreeing to reopen the top step as soon as the governor or signed into law the state school aid act. Okay, so that was really a mutual. It was not just the district that was pushing to for top step teachers to come back after the state school aid act. The next, the next one we want to touch on, and I want to say a couple things about this. Um, at the very top there, you can see for 2016, 17, 18, 18, 19, and 19, 20, you can see the increases that we've provided to our staff. So in 16, 17, we provided one step on schedule, $500 stipend, and full longevity. In 17, 18, we provided one to five steps for teachers and 2% to the top step. They received us an, an additional step 12. In 1819, we had uh, one step, that's a misprint, we gotta clear that up. One step and a 2% at the top, going from step 12B to 12. Then in the last year, we had one step, which is 1920 this current year. So if uh, looking at a couple examples, if we were to look at teacher five, a top step teacher in 2016-17, you can see there they were at the top step, uh, step 11, with a salary of 80,984. And then they received, they moved to step 12, then to step 12B, and finally to a modified step 12 and that movement over those four years resulted in an increase of about $3,000 for that teacher. Looking at teacher seven, a teacher that has been here for quite some time, but they were one of the teachers that was caught up in the freeze. Um, we had a freeze for a number of years when we were not able to provide steps to teachers. In that particular case, the teacher in 1617 was at step two, $44,000. Uh, moved to step seven in 2017-18, a five-step increase, moving them up to roughly just under $60,000. Then going across, uh, you can see another increase to one step to step eight, and finally a step increase to step nine uh, this year. That over those four, peer, four years is roughly a $22,000 increase. And uh, I want to be very clear that we are not apologetic about that. We think our teachers deserve that and more. Teacher four, highlight them for a moment. This is a brand new teacher that came into the district. Uh, they have been lucky enough to earn a step every single year. Um, we want to continue that into the future and make sure that our teachers continue to move on the scale. I share, I, part of the reason I wanted to share this with you is to, again, affirm that we are committed to providing compensation to our teachers. We want to do it in a, a responsible way, a way that's sustainable for our financial bottom line. But we are very much of the mindset that we want our teachers to be compensated. We want our teachers to keep moving. And me as an outsider who's just come to the district to see the fact that we awarded five steps in one year, that's incredible. That's very uh, I, I'm generous. I haven't seen anything like that. So that's awesome.
So um, this slide here uh, we are including as well, kind of give everybody an idea where Anchor Bay stands relative to all of the other oaks in Macomb, Macomb County. So you can see there highlighted in the middle is Anchor Bay. We are ranked number eight in the county in terms of our teacher compensation. Um, you know, you may remember back in September when we came to you and we talked about how uh, well our students were testing on the uh, assessment test, the PSAT, and some of the other AC, ACT and some of those other tests. And uh, you, you rem might remember seeing that Anchor Bay was nearly first or right at the top in almost every single category. That's largely due to our teachers. They do a fantastic job. They're number one academically, and what we want to do, one of our goals, to do it fiscally responsible, but one of our goals is to move Anchor Bay up that ladder there and move them up into the top one or two positions there as well in terms of compensation, because they deserve it. Uh, the test scores speak for themselves. But one thing I want to point out, importantly, if you look at that last column, where it talks to foundational aid. That's the amount of money we receive per student. And you'll notice that the only school that is ahead of us in terms of teacher compensation is uh, Chip Valley. They are paying their teachers a little bit more. They are a minimum funded district, and uh, that's one of the districts that we want to make sure that we can surpass in the, in the years ahead and move up that ranking. So, um, Anita, if you want to flip to the, one of the other things that we're hearing, and I think this goes hand in hand with teachers' compensation. One of the things we're hearing is, um, you know, I made more 10 years ago than I make today. And that's what I think we're really talking about, and we'll, if I can get someone to point, Anita, again. If you look at the gross total across the top, we have actually increased wages for, these te for the teacher. This is an example of a top step teacher. We have increased the wages. If you go down to the bottom though, where it talks about the amount direct deposited, you will see 10 years ago they were making $58,700 that was going into their bank account. Today it's only $47,850. This is a combination of several things. Um, I'm going to talk about the first two that are government mandated. We have no choice in this. Everybody in the state of Michigan is required to file, follow these laws. There are public acts that were passed in 2011. And the first one I want to talk to is PA 75. Uh, public Act 75 requires a 3% contribution for retirement health care. So it, for your retirement health care, every single person who is in the pension defined benefit pension is required to provide 3% towards that health care. So you can see there that's $2,600 that's coming out of this person's check that they didn't have to pay 10 years ago. That's the state of Michigan. The other state of Michigan I'm going to point to is PA 175, and that talks about publicly funded health insurance contributions. So what that means is whether you're a hard cap or an 80-20 district, you may have to make a contribution towards your health care that you have today. And in this particular case, the individual's making a contribution of roughly $4,400 a year towards that contribution. Again, that's coming out of their net check. There are also two other pieces. Two of those are, um, you see the 403B deferred, that's a, uh, a retirement plan. In this particular case, the teachers re uh, decided that they are going to forego the take-home pay and put that away for their retirement. So they've made a conscious decision to take $7,800 out of their paycheck and put it away in retirement. The other one that is an um, employee-driven decision is the HSA employee contribution. So you can see there, again, this is a, a health savings account that is uh, titled in the employee's name, and this is money that the employee will be able to take with them. So that is their money. That's their decision to go ahead and remove that from their net pay. So those are the primary drivers of why many folks feel today, and rightly so, 
that they ha are not earning as much as they did in years past. And again, I, uh, Anita, if you want to flip to the next page, you know, I just want to leave some final thoughts. We are committed to reaching a financially responsible agreement with the ABA. They deserve every penny they've gotten. An administration believes that they deserve more, and we're going to work hard to make sure that they do get more. We just have to make sure that we don't break the bank to do it. Finally, the agreement must be sustainable. It doesn't make any sense for us to reach an agreement that we can't keep into the future. We have to make sure that that's sustainable. Finally, as I talked about, we want to make sure our teachers pay ranks consistent with the way our academics rank, because they've done an amazing job, and we need to work our tails off to make sure that we can pay them everything we can. Are there any questions about my presentation before I jump into the actual financials? Any questions from the board? All right. Go ahead. So it should be an Excel spreadsheet. Um, Anita, if you can jump to that first tab, please, at the bottom. This is also in the board packet. You have this. Um, it's probably under the board piece. But what we're bringing to you tonight is uh, an update on the budget. This will have. Um, this will directly feed into what we're asking resolutions we're asking you to look at and pass later in the um, later in the meeting. Thank you. I know that's not super easy to see. But on this first tab, what we've done is we have excluded um, from this to kind of give you an idea of you know, what the budget looks like without it, what it looks like with it. But in this particular budget, what we've done is we've excluded um, the international fund transfer. So what's happening is we have excess funds from our international fund, and we are proposing to transfer those funds revenue out of that fund and back into the general fund. If we don't do that, the amount we're proposing right now is $650,000. That will drive our loss down to about $4.2 million for this year. We only have a fund balance of about 4.8, so that would leave us with just under $600,000 for only 1% fund balance. So it's very important that we, we transfer that money that helps sustain a lot of the things we do in the general fund. And uh, you will see a resolution asking the board to, tr to uh, ab agree to transfer that money out of the international fund into the general fund. Next tab, please. On this particular slide, um, and again, while she's working on it, uh, what we're doing here is we also have a resolution before you tonight to rescind or take off the textbooks that we previously approved. That was about $500,000. So in this particular slide, what we're showing is if we do the transfer, if we make the transfer of $650,000 that I just talked about out of the international fund into the general fund, and if we eliminate the $500,000 transfer, or $500,000 amount budgeted for the textbooks, um, our, our loss would then decrease to $3.1 million, leaving us with roughly $1.6 million or a 2.6% fund balance. Obviously, that is a much better situation. So this is actually the budget that we will be bringing before the board um, to approve in your resolutions later in the meeting. Um, I want to point out that this does not currently include any monies for the ABEA top step. So that would be another amendment that we'd have to make further down the road. But at this point, we wanted to get something before the board so that they could make an amendment to the current budget and therefore meet all of the requirements of the uh, Uniform Budget Accounting Act. Um, primarily, the other increases that you see there, uh, if you can scroll up just a little bit towards the top of that document, Nita, you can't see it very well. I apologize. But um, 
if you could see it real well, and it is in your packet, by the way, um, so hopefully you've had a chance to look at that, um, you would see that part of the um, major changes in that last column of the variance is we had our enrollment decline, so you could see we do have a drop in our revenues of about $592,000. We also, uh, going to the expense side of things, the primary drivers of the expense increase that we're asking you to approve in the budget are the union negotiated contracts that the board has previously approved. We want to make an update to our budget to reflect both the salaries and the benefits that come out of those. Um, so that's reflected here. Um, we also have a few other items that are reflected in this got an increase in our maintenance costs of roughly $50,000 that we think we'll need to spend in order to um, in order to uh, meet all of our maintenance requirements this year. Um, there's also $50,000 additionally we're adding to our transportation budget for buses and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the meeting as well. Our repair costs have gone up considerably and uh, we've got a plan to address that. So um, are there any other questions about the general fund budget that I can answer um, tonight? Any questions from the board? No, I don't think so. Good job. Um, if you can, I've, I'm going to touch on the international um, as well. Real quickly, it's kind of the same thing. If you can go to that next tab right there. Yep. So on this particular one, again, this is kind of just the opposite side of the general fund. So here it would say it would show you if we leave the six hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the international account, we will end the year with a fairly large balance there. Um, and obviously, not transferring that revenue to the general fund will have an adverse effect on our bottom line. If we flip to the next one, Anita. This is with the transfer coming out. So you can see there um, the $650,000 coming out and going into the general fund. That will be reflected as an expense in the international fund and a revenue coming into the general fund. So you can see there that um, this is the resolution. This is the bottom line that we're proposing that the board passed this evening. This is a resolution that will transfer that $650,000 into the general fund out of the international fund and this is the resolution for the international fund again that we'll be asking you to approve are there any questions about the international fund any questions from the board i did have to add i know todd you had mentioned earlier about the public acts back in 2011 and uh i well recall those because i remember back that about 2010 2011 that's when the state made some drastic cuts. Anchor Bay, we lost about $470 per student in one year. Um, and then, uh, you know, not to editorialize, but the state then put in some additional public acts, one of them on the health care retirement, um, one of them on the hard cap. Um, and I knew then, and many of the superintendents knew then, that once those things were implemented over time, the disappointment from staff, and we're talking all staff, that have to pay in the cost for the retirement, the cost for the retirement health care, um, that that was going to be a bone of contention. But unfortunately, it's Lansing that made the decision. But school boards and administration and superintendents are the only face that someone can see. You know, so when people say, and they are right, that hey, over 10 years, <laughs> I'm making less than I did before. And they are right. There are In some terms of their take home pay. Yeah, they could say that. And, and they are right. And the unfortunate thing is, is, like I said, back in 2011, when that happened, you know, we knew that over the years, once people realized what was going on, there was going to be some local disappointment with school boards and administration and superintendents, which they have no control over. These are public acts, these are monies that we have to withdraw, and uh, there's no way around it, And um, along with many of the other things. So I just wanted to highlight that, that you know, knowing what those changes would do, um, and knowing that in the future they would raise a whole lot of concerns, and, and some of it is rightly so. Um, 
You did also uh, mention that in this budget you you do not have the the two percent. There's a the offer the two percent top st stop. No, we have not included the top top stop in the resolution before the board tonight. Um, if indeed we are able to reach an agreement, which I hope we can soon, we will come back to the board requesting an additional amendment to include that expenditure. And as far as, okay, but what is the cost? The, the cost, cost of 2% off schedule this year is roughly $450,000. And that includes both of the actual salary and the retirement that we're required to pay on that. As, and FICA, FICA would be rolled in there as well. Social Security. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thanks a okay. lot, Todd. Thanks for that uh, presentation. All right, we got the lights. We'll go into open forum at this point. Uh, Tom Braun. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Braun. I'm the president of the Anchor Bay Band Boosters here, to, and uh, I just wanted to come and update the board on some of the events that the band has been doing and, and just what they've been up to. Um, on February 7th, the Anchor Bay Jazz Band participated in the Central Michigan University Jazz Festival. With over 60 performances, they took an award in every category in Class AA. Uh, they took, the band took Best Overall Band, the trombone section won best overall section, and uh, all-state jazz band guitarist Blake Burdock won first runner-up for best soloist. On Janu January 28th, we held our annual Taste Fest at the high school. With over 400 in attendance, this was a fun community-building event where local restaurants were invited to showcase their food while the student musicians <clears throat> get a chance to pr practice their solo and ensemble pieces in front of an audience. At Solo and Ensemble, uh, high school student musicians took home 79 first division and 18 second division ratings. This coming weekend, February 28th and 29th, we'll be hosting the District 16 MSBOA Middle School Band Festival at our high school. Uh, next weekend, March 5th, 6th, and 7th, we'll be hosting the District 16 MSBOA High School Band Festival at Anchor Bay High School. Uh, coming up, we have the Anchor Bay Jazz Band the Anchor Bay Jazz Ensemble will be competing in the District 16 MSBOA Jazz Band Festival at Utica High School on March 26th, and their performance time is 7.40 p.m. Um, in the high school, we've had several students who uh, have been accepted, auditioned and accepted into honors bands, uh, so I want to say congratulations to them. Uh, MSBOA All-State Jazz Ensemble, Blake Burdock on guitar, uh, MSBOA District 16 All-Star Jazz Band was Blake Burdick on guitar, Devin Malamo on piano, Jackson Stone on upright bass, and John Tezak on bass trombone. Uh, Bowling Green State University Honors Band was Lexa Becker on the flute and Jack Stone on the bass. Uh, Detroit Symphony Youth Civic Ensemble, Dylan Grace with the French horn. Michigan State University Spartan Youth Jazz Ensemble was Jack Stone and the upright bass. Uh, Eastern Michigan University High School Honors Band was Haley Schmidlin on the flute. Oakland University Honors Band, David Ludwig on a phonium. Matthew Taylor on trombone and John Tezak on trombone. And then the District 16 Honors Band, we had Samantha Slaybaugh on clarinet, Madeline Daughtry on clarinet, Jack Stone on bass. Matt Taylor on trombone, John Taylor on trumpet, uh, Chanel Maley on clarinet, Haley Schmidlin on flute, and Victoria Ludwing on tuba. In addition, at the middle school level, uh, the middle schoolers also went to solo and ensemble. There were 20 first division and six second division ratings at solo and ensemble, and as well as there's 13 students that auditioned and were accepted to the MSBOA District 16 Honors Band in the middle school. All right, thank you for that update. Uh, Mary Newman.
name is Mary Newman, and I'd like to read a letter to you. For almost 30 years, my sister and I have been with Anchor Bay Schools, and we are writing this, excuse me, I'm reading this today to voice my complete and utter letdown in our district. I have never wanted to teach anywhere but Anchor Bay. This is my home. I attended Anchor Bay Schools, my siblings, my friends, went to Anchor Bay Schools, many of which have stayed to raise our children and even some grandchildren in this area, in this district. Administration holds up their staff, our staff, as wonderful in the newspapers and other reports. They praise the test scores that continue to increase. These test scores are a direct reflection of the amazing and tireless work that the teachers and support staff do year after year to help our students of this district continue to achieve. I have defended our district over and over again to outsiders, to even members of our own community. What is being done to the teachers at the top of the list is beyond wrong. We have taken pay cuts, accepted pay freezes, all to help our district with the promises of compensation when the district was in a better financial position. Well, our district is in a better financial position, and we helped make that happen. Yet when wages for our senior staff came to the negotiation table this past fall, the promises made were broken. We were told that once the budget came, financials would be discussed. Administration came to Anchor Bay Education Association with an offer, and with each and every counter from Anchor Bay Education, they were met with the same offer. This is not negotiating in good faith. To say this last offer for those at the top is insulting doesn't honestly begin to describe the way it made me and my sister and others feel. We are here asking you to reconsider the last final and best offer, your only offer, by sending these letters because we fear for our jobs. We fear retaliation. We fear the target on our back that so many of us already wear because we choose to speak out about the iniquities and the insults that we have felt and have dealt with over the last several years as a teacher in our district. I love this district. My family is raising generations in this district. We want this district to succeed. We will do what it takes to succeed. I personally do not feel that everyone is helping us to succeed. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. All right, Dawn, I'm probably going to hack, that's it. Good evening. My relationship with Anchor Bay Schools began 19 years ago. I was hired as a preferred sub and substitute taught in every building in this district that year. My husband and I both grew up in Shelby Township, but after spending time in all of your buildings, from elementary all the way through high school, I decided I wanted to start our family here in New Baltimore. My husband opposed this move because it was further from his work, but I pleaded with him to trust me on this one. I wanted to be a part of this community. I went from building to building and was welcomed by very warm and wonderful teachers. They were the kind of women and men I wished to have helped me guide and influence my future children when they came to be. Eight years later, I had my children start in your school system at the young age of three. As a mother, it was very difficult to leave my children in the care of another, but your teachers always made me feel very secure that they were well cared for. They were always in close communication with me and made whatever modifications necessary to meet the needs of my children. This care has continued to present day. 
I was extremely nervous about the transition of my children from elementary to middle school. Two of my children have special needs and teen years are filled with anxiety and pressure. The middle school principal met with me to ease my worries and to develop a plan to support my sons during this time of change. My husband and I were instantly very impressed with the principal and her professionalism. We felt very confident that, this that our children's transition would be smooth with her guidance and assistance. Only when the children started, she was not there. There was very little explanation from the district and only months later did I find out that the person I had counted on had been forced to make a difficult decision to leave. Thankfully, you have a wonderful staff of teachers that pitched in to create new plans for my boys. My sons were blessed to have a caseworker that is a truly amazing teacher, the best I have seen. She became their advocate and addressed all of their needs in every class. She showed them respect, humor, friendship, and consideration to earn their trust. She showed them with her many actions she was worthy of that trust. Some days it was bringing them a special treat like Timbits, while other days it was talking to them before class. Some days it was mediating between them and the other teachers to be their voice when they were frustrated with their academic demands. She and the rest of your fine staff have lived up to what I hoped they would be. But I keep having this nagging feeling that the people entrusted to support them are not showing them the same consideration that they show my children every day. Your presentation was wonderful, and I hope that it's true that you are looking for their best interest, but I don't feel like they're making me feel assured that that's really what is going on here. Are you really giving your staff the same respect they give to their, their students and community? Who can advocate for them? Their teachers have a union, yes, but do you treat the union members with the same consideration they show their students? It saddens me to think that my ch child's teacher spends so much of her day advocating for our children that struggle, yet no one is advocating for them. Why is it okay that they are forced to struggle? Why is it okay that they feel there will be re repercussions if they stand up or if they walk out? Your senior staff was promised a new wage negotiation would occur this past fall, and still they wait. Now your presentation explained that you have met, but I don't feel like it's completely transparent if the same proposal was proposed twice. And I'm sure that I understood that you said that you met four times, and it's not really what I'm hearing. So maybe I need to digest some of your facts and figures from your presentation. It's a lot of small, fine print being thrown at me all at once. But every single time there's been a vote to increase your funding, I have voted in favor of it. I am in favor of paying all I can afford to support my community. But I want to know how you are going to use the funds to pay and support the most influential and important people that are members of this community. I am speaking tonight because I want your teachers to know the community sees them. I see them. I see how hard they work and the extra care they give my children. I see what they deserve. And I also see the way they've been disrespected by members of this board in recent years. And I am appalled by that. I'm embarrassed at the way that certain members have tried to discredit anyone that's opposed you. Paying your staff what they deserve, especially the higher teachers that are still waiting, would be a great first step towards finally treating them with the respect they deserve and a necessary step to retaining your talent in times of a teacher shortage. Thank you. Amy Tarnacki. Mr. Drew, at the last board meeting, you mentioned how you have not heard any examples of negative or hostile work environments here at Anchor Bay. That last presentation we had is not an example I don't know what is. I do know personally, I've sat at a table with you and Anchor Bay teachers, and we have had those conversations with you. So I'm here to give you another example. Recently, the ABEA was informed our members would not have access to the school email while we are off on leave. First, I would like to point out that because Anchor Bay has switched over to using Office 365, the shutting off of teachers' access to email also blocks teachers' access to the files saved in the cloud or any other data saved used using their Anchor Bay ID in Outlook. Teachers are never off duty, even while caring for a sick family member, a newborn child, or recovering from an illness or surgery themselves. It is simply who we are. I personally have just returned from a medical leave. 
My anchor EB, my, sorry, I'm very upset from that presentation. My Anchor Bay email kept me in touch with all four buildings I work in. Staff meeting agendas, calendar updates, and other memos from principals and secretaries kept me assured when I returned to work, I would be up to date. More important was information concerning students. Across those four buildings I teach and I have 35 sections for an approximate total of 800 students. While I was gone, students moved out, students moved in, behavior and academic goals were put in place or adapted. If not for the ability to periodically check in with my work email, I would not have returned to work knowing those student-specific things. I also worked on lesson plans for my return, even took the time to reflect on on existing lessons to see how I could change things up and challenge my students in new ways. If I had been locked out of Office 365, this would not have been completely impossible, but a challenge I'm sure none of you would have wanted to face with one arm in a sling. With this new policy, it is the students of Anchor Bay who will suffer. For it is not simply, for it is, so I'm, as I said, I apologize, I'm so upset. For us to not simply to be able to read emails and access our files, the children will suffer. I was still an Anchor Bay employee while on leave, still responsible to show student growth with these students as part of my job requirement upon return. However, as that Anchor Bay employee, this just feels like one more of the many things Central Office holds over us to prove that they have the power and we are just replaceable cogs in a machine. Uh, Cheryl Stinkus. Good evening. I first spoke at a school board meeting a little over two years ago. After I learned that our teachers have been on a pay freeze for six years, and weren't being treated fairly during contract negotiations. At that meeting, I showed my support for our teachers. And here I am, again, two years later, doing the same thing. My hope is that there are new board members who value our teachers as I do, and will listen to me, and more importantly, listen to our teachers. There are, very, there are many valuable employees in our district, from maintenance to bus drivers, secretaries, food service, paras, and of course, our teachers. All these people have received a well-earned increase this year, all but the highest pay step teachers. From what I understand, this includes almost 200 of our Anchor Bay teachers. My question is, why are you punishing our most educated and longest tenure teachers? Aren't they the most valued asset of our district? How will you keep the other amazing teachers at lower steps from leaving after seeing how the top tier are being treated? How will you attract new teachers to the district when they hear how you treat those that should be prized? How will you attract new students to the district when the parents hear that our teachers aren't valued? How will you keep current students from leaving when there are no qualified teachers to teach the classes they want or they need? The Port President has made comments about what is being unsaid on social media. The Anchor Bay Watchdog page has been a great place to give information out to the community regarding matters of the district. Are you watching? Did you read everything that has been comment, commented on regarding the superintendent's review of highly effective? Teachers don't even receive a rating of highly effective in their yearly reviews, and they are the reason the district test scores are so great. Have you read the anonymous teacher stories on the ABEA page? In case you haven't, you should. You can find it under the hashtag, not highly effective. One last thing. The superintendent's review should be made public for the community to see. I know it can be FOIA'd, but if there is nothing to hide and you are proud of the review, it should be up for all to see. And it should include how each board member rated him on each individual domain. From the public forum vote, three board members voted differently than the other four. Isn't there an average of the ratings, or is it a majority? I don't understand how a superintendent can be rated highly effective when three of the four board members, 
three of the seven board members did not vote that way. During the last election, the community sent a strong message voting in four new board members. We were done with seeing the way things were being run. We see who is listening to the community and our teachers, and we see who isn't. We have a, another chance to make our voices heard this November. Don't make promises you can't keep. Uh, Deb Hunter. Is this on? Can you hear me? Passionate givers. Passionate givers. These are words that describe the teachers in our Anchor Bay School District. Good evening, my name is Deb Hunter and I am a teacher in our district. I know that many of the teachers that are here tonight are frustrated because of the lack of appreciation they have felt over the years through financial means. I am one of them. With that being said, my focus will be on the amazing teachers we have in Anchor Bay. At the beginning of each school year, we are preparing our classrooms for our new group of students. You may see us at a garage sale, maybe Target, um, maybe online, a thrift shop. We're trying to save money. We want to make sure that our classes are inviting and that we have all the materials that we need to make engaging classroom activities. We are eager to meet our students. We like what we see and are eager to raise your child to his or her highest level. It's a challenge to us. That means not only academically, but emotionally and mentally as well. You see, we like our students at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year, we fall in love with them. We see them as an extension of ourselves. We want the best for your children, for our children, because we are passionate about what we do, and we are givers. It's a calling, and it's hard work. We're with our children, your children, at least six hours out of every day. We, are not, we not only educate your children, but encourage your child to do his or her best. We allow them to see the possibilities that hard work can achieve. You see, we are not preparing your child for the, this day or the next day. We're preparing your child for a lifetime of success, not just the time spent in our classroom. We want our students to have every possible opportunity. We hold your child accountable so that he or she will realize that follow through and good work ethic is awesome and needed and possible. We do this even if they don't want to. Why? Because we care. We are teaching life skills and we are givers and passionate about what we do. We always have the long-term effects and goals for your child in mind. How will your child be prepared and successful in the future? This is constantly on our minds every day when we're in school and when we're at home. We want to give them all that we have so that they may feel confident, determined, and empowered. We educate them. We problem solve with them. We laugh with them. And sometimes we have to have that dreaded discussion with them in order to get them back on track. We teach because we are givers and we are passionate about what we do. We are constantly making observations continuously all day long because that is what good teachers do. And let me tell you, Anchor Bay is full of amazing teachers. We collect data both formally and informally. Teachers are some of the best data collectors in the world. We've always done this because we know that in order for a child to reach the next level, we must know where that child has been, where they are, and where they need them to be. We are givers, and we are passionate in what we do. We also have ever-changing programs in our district to help us achieve the goals we have prepared for your child, and none of those programs are great. They're not. If you look across the United States, the programs in our schools are not awesome. They're not great. Teachers 
make these programs great. We make them work. We adapt them to meet the needs of our classes, our students, and every single class in this district looks different every single day, every minute, every single week, every single month, and every single year. We adapt. We make our programs amazing. We do. We are the magic behind these programs. At night, when many parents are sleeping, we are in bed thinking about your child and how we can implement, redefine, rework, differentiate instruction so your child can be prepared. We cook dinner, we wash clothes, we spend time with our families, often thinking about your child. When our family is sick and need, we're often taking care of someone else's sick child that is sent to school. Your child's well-being rests on our shoulders, always. We have no choice because we care, are passionate about what we do, and we are givers. We are professionals, and we take our job very seriously. We are told our scores are some of the best in the county. We are proud of this accomplishment. Teachers, all staff, colleagues, PTO, and parents, I want to acknowledge and salute you for all you have sacrificed for the children in our district. Your efforts, perseverance, and determination during the school day, your efforts outside of the school day that may take away from your personal life and the life of your family, the money that is spent of your own that does not go to your family, but to the children of our school families. Thank you. You are simply amazing and a blessing to us all. Thank you. Jamie Petron. Okay, well, first of all, um, I would like to actually thank you for that transparency that you put up. Um, even though I was at Central Office yesterday for a meeting, and nobody mentioned that this was going to happen. Um, Todd, before I was in a meeting with you yesterday, if you remember that. Um, because our members are able now to look and see that there was one offer that the district came back with the entire time we were bargaining until the very end with the TA, which the membership turned down. So I'm not really sure what all that was, but I, I actually want to thank you for that. It's actually made my job easier. Second, I would like to make it very clear that the ABA is a strong and united organization. Oh. Um, I have heard many false narratives, such as the ABA is hey, Jamie, losing. Jamie, you yeah. want to? Okay. Um, I've heard many false narratives, such as the ABA is losing members all the time. That is fake news. We have had and continue to have over 90% total membership since EDUs were um, in, put into place in this district. We stand proud, united, and in solidarity as an organization and are stronger than ever. I have also heard that lots of members are upset about the, how the ABA is being run and that they do not support the ABA leadership. Again, this seems to be a nasty narrative to try to devalue the hard work that the ABA leadership team has done over the past several years. I am very confident that the majority of the membership stands in solidarity with us, as you can tell by the people who braved the um, snowy roads to get here today. That being said, if the rumor out there is true, there actually is an ABEA election coming up in March. And um, if they don't want me, then I won't be back. I believe in democracy and letting people vote the way they see fit. And if I'm not the leader they want, obviously I won't be here. But I will be able to say with absolute confidence that I fought for our members. I worked tirelessly to serve them in their best interest. And they, that was my only motivation along the way not some personal agenda with self-serving principles at the forefront. My goal was, and always will be, transparency and honesty. Third, the ABA does not in any way, shape, or form support privatization of any other units. 
I have heard on numerous occasions that when the teachers go in and negotiate, we intentionally don't leave money for other units. Or even worse, we're unhappy about their contract and raises. Not only is this a blatant, vile lie, I believe this is a direct attempt to pit Anchor Bay units against each other and undermine the ABEA leadership. Anyone who works in a school knows how much every single employee in this building and outside the building matters. From supportive building principals to dedicated bus drivers, secretaries, paraprofessionals, custodial staff, cafeteria workers, and others, the ship, as we say at Middle School North, would certainly sink. My father was a hard-working, proud union pipe fitter, and he taught me at an early age the value of solidarity. To suggest that I or our membership think any differently is, again, fake news. Last but certainly not least, whether it is popular or not, I will continue to be transparent with my members. I will continue to speak up, I will continue to be advocate, and I will continue to represent the ABA to the best of my ability. To all of you sitting on the board, please note that if you are willing to work with me to get things done, to work positively and collaboratively for the betterment of this, of this district, then I am willing to work with you. I am proud to be an Anchor Bay teacher. I am so proud of the hard work every single one of our teachers puts forth every single day in the classroom. I love being a teacher. I love seeing students succeed. I love the ABA, and I believe to my core in solidarity. It is time to stop the games to get this contract resolved and move forward in a positive, transparent, and collaborative direction. All right, is there anyone else that would like to address the board in this open forum? All right, our uh, student congress, Riley Arnold, couldn't make it tonight. Our JRLTC, I don't believe, is here, a representative for them. Is there? What's that? Next month, okay. So at this point, we have a closed session for an expulsion that, uh, hearing that we need to hold. So. If I could get a motion to convene to consider a student of expulsion, motion to go into closed session pursuant to Section 8B of the Open Meetings Act. So moved. Moved I'll by Mr. Mr. Green. Is there a second by Mr. Moses? Uh, vote by roll, I believe. They have to be voted by roll. Uh, Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yep. Mr. Moses? Yes. Berkmeyer, yes. Mr. DeRue? Yes. All right, we will be adjourned or we're going to go into closed session. We'll be back as soon as we can. All right, we're going to if I get a motion to come back from closed session. So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. All right, this time we just held that expulsion hearing, so we got a recommendation for to have a motion to expel student number 0703 for violating the Anchor Bay School District violation of MCL 380-1131A2 uh, with a subject, and we're gonna spell them with, to the end of the year with subject to reinstatement. Can I get a motion for that? I will make that motion. Motion by Green, a second. second. Talking by Moses, vote by roll. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. DeRue? Yes. Motion passes. Now, we'll go back to Todd for the budget resolutions we have tonight. Thank you, President DeRue. Uh, before the board tonight, uh, the first resolution that we had before the board tonight is a resolution to transfer funds from the International Fund to the General Fund, as we discussed during the budget uh, update. Those funds, we're talking about $650,000 worth of funds that will be surplus in the International Fund will be transferred to the General Fund to help sustain operations in the General Fund. All right. Is there a... Motion to adopt that amendment. Um, I'll make it. <laughs> Motion made by Moses. Is there a second? 
I second. Seconded by Mr. Witt. Uh, is there any discussion? Yes. Mr. Middlestad. Um, when the international program was put together, the intent was surplus funds would be used to for student services and structural material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think the intent was to supplement the general fund because of deficits, but um, what has been presented today is quite evident that that program has brought in substantial funds for the district despite a lot of rhetoric about the value of the program. And we know the value of the program has been from just instructional um, and having um, the programs in the elementaries, et cetera. But again, this, is, this is program has been a, providing us some surplus funds so we can um, um, hold up our, this deficit that's been created. So I see, I see no, I hate to go against what we kind of, the intent of the funds were, but we're in a situation we are because we spent too much money. So I, I have no objection, but again, I, I have a real problem that, that we have to not, we have to divert funds from instructional direct student services, and that's kind of why they, we uh, had the textbook money. We're going to have that resolution coming up, but part of the intent was to provide uh, those funds or supplemental funds to provide direct services, and, and we're in a situation where we can't do that. So it's just unfortunate that we're put in this situation. So that's my only comment. Any other discussion? All right. Before we vote on it, I'll read the actual resolution for everybody. Whereas the Anchor Bay School District operates an international exchange program with students from China, and whereas Anchor Bay School District receives both tuition and state aid foundational payments for the 49 students in the international program, and whereas the finances associated with the international program are accounted for in a special revenue fund separate from the general fund, and whereas the international program is expected to produce a surplus of over 700,000 for the 2019-2020 school year. Now therefore be it resolved, the Anchor Bay School Board of Education hereby authorizes a transfer of funds in the amount of 700 or 650,000 from the international fund to the general fund for the 2019-20 school year. Well, uh, vote by roll. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Ms. Berkmeyer, yes. Mr. DeRue? Yes. Motion passes. Proposal passes. Next. The resolution before the board tonight is to approve the international program budget amendment. Uh, we pre presented that also during the budget update. Uh, and the primary reflect, uh, change there is that we are reflecting the full amount of the transfer. Is there a motion to approve the international budget amendment? I'll make the motion. Motion by Moses. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Ms. Berkmeyer. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Drew? Yes. Motion passes. The next resolution before the board this evening is the textbook rescission resolution. Uh, Trustee Middlestat touched on this in the past. Um, we, were we were utilizing the transfer of international funds to purchase specific uh, instructional materials for our students. Uh, initially, in April of 2019, $500,000 was set aside for that purchase. Uh, this resolution would undo that resolution and free up those funds to be utilized in the general fund. All right. Uh, I'll read this resolution and see if we can get a motion for it. Just just one second. Uh, I think we just, we already made this motion and second. I think it was tabled, right, Mr. Green? I believe so. Yes. Oh, it was tabled. That is, yeah. So we could just bring it back and... Uh, right. And go to right to vote on it. So correct. So I can't um, remember. We can check the minutes. Let's check who made it and who seconded it. Yep. But as far as that, is there any discussion on it? Well, I I would just like. I'm sorry. 
I would just like to say that uh, since this resolution was brought up, um, and although it was difficult for me to accept that we have come so far and then have to rescind the purchase of textbooks, and even though uh, Mr. Drew and I um, do not agree on where or what meeting this all did occur, since that time, uh, we've gone back to the Finance Committee. Uh, it, all of the information has been evaluated, and uh, I really do feel that this is what needs to be done at this time in order for us to address the budget uh, challenges that we have right now. Okay, yeah, to that matter, after the last meeting, we, we did, uh, we called a finance committee meeting. We, we talked in length about what happened at the last meeting, who knew what, and, and all that, and we, you know, beat it to a dead horse, but we figured it out. We all know what, what needs to be done, at least on the finance committee, and this is our recommendation. So is there any other discussion from the board? Uh, we'll vote by roll. Don't you have to make a motion to pull it off the table? What's that? We tabled it, so we're taking right, it. Right, so we're don't you have to make a motion to take it Not to bring it back, no. Okay. Just tabled so to the, the next, next meeting, meeting to vote on it. Okay. The motion is it to... It would be called old business. ...to rescind the $500,000. The motion is to rescind the $500,000 that we had originally voted on to buy textbooks. Now we're not going to buy those textbooks if we pass this. Okay. Uh, Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Berkmeyer, Yes. Mr. Drew? Yes. Resolution passes. And lastly? The, the final resolution before the board with respect to the budget is the general fund budget resolution. As we presented in our budget update, we have a resolution before the board that would include the transfer that resolution that we just passed, the transfer from the international fund. It also includes the resolution you just passed to remove the textbooks and uh, the resolution before you would leave us with uh, $3.1 million deficit for the current year. Um, that would leave us roughly $1.7, $1.8 million in the fund balance or about 2.6%. What's the one, is, what's percent is the 1.7? Fund equity. Fund equity was 2.6%? 2.6%. 2.6%. And that's not including anything we do going forward with top step. Correct. And what's that turn into next year? I'm sorry? You had those numbers for us. I thought, what, that, what does that go into for next year? I know that's what we end this year at. What about the following year? Yeah, so um, as we discussed in the finance committee, uh, we would propose to end, we'll end at $3.1 million, leaving us with a $3.1 million deficit this year, leaving us with one point seven going into next year. The problem that we have right now is that we have created a structural deficit, which means that the contractual obligations and the cost to operate our district exceed right now the amount of money that we're bringing into the district. So in order to right that ship uh, and continue to keep us from going into debt, we will have to make significant cuts. Uh, we will also have to potentially grow revenues as a way of trying to meet that um, the enhancement millage would be one way to do that. Uh, another way to meet that would be through cuts to the district. On the enhancement millage, is it, and I just making sure at our finance committee meeting and just what we talked about for the public to know, if we get, even if we get the enhancement millage, it's not going to be extra money, right? It's going to, we're still going to be below 5%. And we're going to be, that'll just keep us at the 2.6% the two next year. And if we don't get the enhancement millage, we're going to go down to like 1.8. Yeah, so structurally speaking, we are spending more than we're taking in. So if we get an additional $2.4 million and we're spending $3 million more than we're taking in annually, uh, so there's hundreds of factors that go into this. But... Assuming that we continue to spend $3 million more than we're bringing in, the enhancement millage, if that were to pass, would bring in $2.4 million, which would narrow the amount of loss from $3 million to 600000 If we receive additional monies from the governor, that may get us back to a break-even position, but 
unless there are additional cuts that are made, uh, it's quite likely that we would be in the position you suggest, where our fund balance would be essentially the same it is this year, uh, and that we would not have additional funds to do any sort of contract increases or raises in that regard. My, my main reason for bringing it up and for talking about it is tonight we've heard a lot, but it's, it's in its thinking that this enhancement millage is going to put us with a lot of extra money. And unless I don't believe your numbers, they're, we're going into deficit spending and we're just going to get worse and worse each year unless we change something here. Or Your understanding I, I, is correct. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, a lot, a, the, along the lines of the transparency, along the lines of, you know, you... The public has said do more talking in front of the public of the conversations we have, especially at committee meetings. And in that finance committee meeting, it was eye-opening, at least to me as a new board member, as far as the decisions we've made already this year and what that's going to do to us going down the line. So is there anybody else that wants to? Yeah, I'd just like to clarify that one of the reasons this um, uh, shortage has occurred was because we had... Um, a decrease in enrollment of, was it 110? 115, yeah. yes. 115 students, and unfortunately that is a trend. And we have, we're graduating uh, senior classes that have approximately 100 kids more than the kindergarten classes coming in. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have to do uh, some um, long range planning and uh, be anticipating that this trend is going to continue at least for the next several years. Yeah, this is it for the next four years that we will see those decreases. Does anybody else have anything from the board? All right. There Was there a motion? Did we make a motion? Did anybody make a motion to uh, accept the general fund budget resolution? I'll make the motion. Motion by Ms. Berkmeyer. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded second. by Mr. Witt. I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> All right. Discussion by Mr. Middlestat. Yes, it's uh, it's quite unfortunate as we maintained for the last four or five years around 11 percent fund equity, and that 10, 10 11 percent dropped to almost two percent. So it's just unfortunately, and I and I understand the enrollment went down and the state didn't get what we expected, but we should have waited. I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but we should have waited before we knew what we had before we gave it away. So that's done and that's over and done with. But I think it's a lesson learned that you can't allocate or it's not that we don't respect people or respect giving out raises, but you've got to be able to look ahead and say, do I have enough money to spend? Because what Todd's talking about is a structural deficit is we've given away more than we're bringing in. And we, we could have rationed that off a little bit better if we had planned ahead. So I think it's just unfortunate that we're in the situation we're in. So that's my only comment. Any other discussion from the board? All right. All the, uh, we'll vote by rule on that. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Ms. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Giroux? Yes. Uh, the resolution passes. All right, at this point, bring Ms. Laura up to talk about the TAs that were settled with the ABEA. Good evening. So before you tonight, we have um, TAs from May 20th, June 27th, August 15th, and the school calendar for the 2020-2021 school year for your approval. Is there a motion to approve these TAs? I'll make a motion. Motion by Mr. Moses. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Mr. Green. Is there any discussion? Just one comment. So once we, once we approve this, then we can get a the approved contract out on the website so everybody can see what we it's not an ongoing doing this today means that there's a contract correct so we can put that on the transparency site 
Yes, we still wouldn't have the top step negotiated, but we ha would have all the language issues done. Correct, but the top step would be another TA. So I think we need to have that published so people can see what the contract is. Because right now you're going to transparency, and I've mentioned this before, on the transparency site we still got the old contract there, and we pretty much have it 98% complete. So that's all my comment. Yeah, because all the language would be done right after tonight. Yes, we have been working on updating the contract and, and updating the language. So um, once this is approved, it would be a, a pretty quick turnaround to get the new contract published. Okay. Mr. Green? I supported the motion, but I'll rescind my support if you don't get the school calendar published as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, any other discussion? Uh, we'll vote by roll on these. Mr. Green? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Meyer, yes. Mr. DeRue? Yes. All right. Now we got a resolution to appoint a district PD committee. I'll read the resolution. Whereas the 2019-20 Final School Aid Act allows a district to count up to 38 hours of qualifying professional development for teachers as hours of pupil instruction, and whereas at least eight hours of the qualifying professional development must be recommended by a district-wide professional development advisory committee consisting of teachers, non-teaching staff, parents, and administrators, and whereas the district-wide professional development advisory committee must be appointed by the Board of Education, now therefore be it resolved the Anchor Bay School District Board of Education hereby appoints the individuals listed herein this resolution to, compr to comprise the district-wide professional development advisory committee for the 2019-20 school year. And should we read off the names or? I don't know. We'll, the names would be on the website, so. Is there a motion to pass this resolution? I'll make the motion. Motion by Mr. Moses. Is there a second? I'll support. Supported by Mr. Green. Is there any discussion? I just have one comment. Can you, uh, I don't need it tonight, but can you explain to us how this works? Because I, I know these committees are out there, but how do, how do you interface with the committees, the administration? Man? Yeah, we can we get that back. That's a so I'm not quite sure. I mean, I've, Me neither. I've this is a new off committee. And on, off yeah. and on, I've, there's been different ways of doing it. So, All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion, or resolution passes. Now we'll go to Todd for a possible severance plan to be looked at by the board. Yes, so thank you, President Drew. In your board packet, there is a summary of the plan that we propose to offer to individuals here at Anchor Bay who have been in the ABEA or administrators that have worked for a period of 12 years here at Anchor Bay. Those are the folks that would be eligible for this plan. The underlying reason for the severance plan is that we believe that this employee severance plan will allow, will allow the district to substantially increase retirements and resignations in a manner which will reduce salary costs for the district and reduce the need for involuntary layoffs. We also believe that this will provide additional funds to the district to maintain the highest possible educational standards. Um, what the, essentially, in a nutshell, the substance of the plan is that we would offer individuals who are eligible $65,000 as a severance amount over five years. Um, they would be, uh, there's a window that they will have an opportunity to talk with an advisor about this severance plan uh, if they decide they want to take advantage of such. After, at some point in time in the future, when the window closes, the board will have the opportunity to evaluate the results how many people have taken the severance plan and whether or not it is fiscally responsible, uh, responsible to move forward with the severance plan. So the board would ultimately have the right to uh, not move forward if it doesn't make financial sense. If it does make financial sense, the board would have the right to move forward with that. 
and then at that point in time, any individual who has signed up will receive a seven-day rescission period where they would have an opportunity to pull back and not take advantage of the severance plan if they decided they did not want to. So that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. If there are additional questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, Ms. DeWitt? Just to clarify, this does not require retirement on the part of those who are going, that would opt to that be is part a great, of the plan. Great question. This does not require their retirement. This is a severance plan. So you could take the severance. You would be able to go to another district and work if you, if you so desired. Any other discussion? Mr. Green? Todd, is there a minimum number of people that have to sign up for the program in order for it to be in effect? There is, it is somewhat dependent on who signs up, but generally speaking, we're targeting 25 individuals. Not individuals, yeah. just 25 people. 20, we're not I'm, looking yeah. for certain people to say, get out of here. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I want to be very clear. Yeah, yeah. 25 people are what we think will be the number to make it economically feasible for the district. And if we don't hit that number, do we rescind, we back out? What happens next? We would likely back out. Mr. Middlestat? Yeah, we've done these, this is probably the third time, third or fourth time we've done this. And in a nutshell, what you're doing is you're spending $1.6 million additional funds to incentive, as an incentive to have people retire early. So if we have people retiring, 25 people, five per year in the next five years, that naturally could happen, but this is this is an incentive, but it's, it's extra money, right? It's $1.6 million money that we didn't have to spend if we didn't have to, but it, what it does, it just makes our budget better now, right? In a nutshell, right? That's correct, yeah. We're looking at substantial savings, about $1.2 million by uh, expediting or uh, increasing the retirement now as opposed to allowing folks to draw the large salaries for a number of years and then not being able to take advantage of that savings. So, so we're banking on that certainly with the current budget situation we are in that we probably won't have many raises in the next couple of years that we're banking that we're not that's not going to be an incentive enough for people to want to leave. So all I, all I have a problem with is I'm spending $1.6 million for, to make things look better now. Yeah, I, I don't know if you could say the, the analogy you're using is over five years, but I don't, know, I don't know if we could say it's over 5, 10, or 15 that we would get 25 people. I understand the analogy, but we don't, we don't know over what time period that would be. And, and essentially, you know, you'd be... You know, over a 10, 15 year period, you'd be spending the same amount, 1.6 million, or with the severance incentive, you're basically spending it all at once. And it does reduce your current costs. Yeah. No, I understand. And we, I know, just... we know financially the situation we're moving forward in. You know, I mean, the, you know, I think Todd had explained earlier, I, the. It was, it was great we were able to do the things we did for staff this school year, but that's a cost that stays on every year thereafter. So we need to reduce our expenditures. Any other questions from the board or, or comments from the board on this? Well, I guess first is, is there a motion to approve the severance plan as presented? I make the motion. Motion by Mr. Moses. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded, Seconded by, by Ms. DeWitt. Uh, we'll vote by roll on this one. Mr. Green? Yes. Ms. DeWitt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? No. Mr. Moses? Yes. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. DeRue? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, Superintendent Woodside. Going to give us an internal control update? Um, yeah, I think Todd, we'll have Todd. Yeah, I'd be happy to take Todd, you're going to do that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So uh, recently. You get a toaster tonight. I know. A lot of mic time. Uh, recently, as we discussed, the JROTC investigation concluded. Um, 
out of that, there were findings that the colonel had submitted reports to the United States Air Force where he had identified eighth graders as ninth graders. That really hit home for us that it's very important for us as a school district to ensure that we are reviewing and monitoring all of the reports that go out. Um, we will no longer allow one individual to complete a financial report on their own with no oversight or review and that uh, before the report is sent out. So in an effort to enhance our programmatic and fiscal reporting, we are implementing an internal control uh, where we are getting with every single building uh, leader and every director, everyone who has responsibility for external reporting, and we are having them put together a list of all of the reports that the district sends out. They're identifying who prepares the list. They are also identifying someone who will review the list. And then once that is complete, we will add that to our administrative regulations and make sure that we have a system in place of check, checks and balances that ensure that no one person can complete a report without a proper review. Yeah, and I think any, I think what we, I think in a nutshell that any financial reports we have that we're submitting where, you know, a individual is impacted um, by that financially, that we're going to put measures in place to avoid that. <laughs> that if someone is submitting a financial report where they could gain, personally gain from, we have to address that and put safeguards in place. Now, as it pertains to the uh, JRLTC, because I know in the report and in the contract with the JRLTC, who is now over the JRLTC program? Is it, because it, like I it said, it's supposed to be the high school principal, but what was found out was he didn't know much about the program, so. We've had conversations with the high school principal. He's now aware of these reports, and we will work with him through this process to ensure that he is aware in signing off on those reports. Yeah, you have a, a CTE director and the high school principal are both Correct. responsible for oversight. Correct. I just, and I know that we have a CT director, and that's what she put in there. As she's not an academic, she's a lawyer, and she had mentioned that for you guys to come up with how those two are to work together, I just want to make sure that we, I mean, like I've said through this, this whole thing, and I've said it to the other board members, is, you know, yes, yeah, this happened, this was bad, this was, there's was a lot of stuff that went on. We can't see it again anywhere in the district of where something that should be known by multiple people wasn't known. I think that's, if anybody else has anything they got to say. But. And that's really what this internal yeah. control is meant to address. Perfect. I do have a quick okay. comment, Mr. President. A couple years ago, somewhere between five and $7,000 disappeared out of a PTG elementary school fund. And I was promised at that time that these type of controls would be put in place and these things wouldn't happen again. So I just want to make sure that you know, we're obviously passing this, we're, we're voting on the controls, or it's just an update, I'm sorry. I've been told that before, and here we are again. So I'm hoping that uh, we don't have these issues uh, repeat themselves again. Yeah, I don't think those, I don't know who told you that, but I don't think these two instances, yeah. I don't think these two instances are the same. We're talking about a federal report that's provided to the state. Um, that's what we're talking about here. Um, the Lottie Schmidt situation, I believe, was a parent doing a fundraiser and basically keeping the money. Um, we've always had parameters in place as far as fundraising, PTOs, athletics that the person who collects the money should not be the person who reconciles the bank, bank statement and makes that deposit. Those need to be different people. Um, so that is in place now if it's, you know, circumvented as far as a booster, PTA, anything like that, you know, that's possible if people just don't follow what uh, the procedures are for taking in money. You know, basically the person to make a deposit can't be the person reconciling the bank's statement. You know, we can't have that with any. So those are, these are two different. This was a situation where a, a financial report was being done. It did have safeguards because the year-end report would have a signature from an administrator of the district and the individual filling it out. 
but that was not done. Uh, I'll say this, Pat, I, I mean, obviously that's something you were personally, I mean, looks like you might have been personally involved in and, and know about, but that was, I think that was prior to us being on the board, to me being on the board. I'm taking everything as when I'm on this board and what I see and what I know of and can find out all the surrounding facts around. I mean, as far as myself, that's how I'm looking at it uh, going forward. So does anybody else have anything on the internal controls? All right. Uh, Sportsplex update agreement, possibly. Todd. Yeah, so this was a very late addition to the packet. In fact, you just received it tonight. Um, we've been in conversations uh, with the Sportsplex. Uh, they are in the process right now of going to the bank and talking about getting refinancing. Um, and so they came to us and were talking to us about, you know, what would we like to do? The, the thought was, if the building, once the building, I should say, is expanded to a full field, the concern uh, was that there might be a lot of use that takes place with the field, and we wanted to make sure that Anchor Bay does not get locked out of that use. Um, having other schools or other organizations coming in and taking our time. So we started having conversations with them, and we started looking at different pricing models. Uh, one of the price, you can see there, the current pricing model is based on usage, and it's a straight $200 every day we use the facility once it's expanded to a full uh, football field facility. What we're starting to do, and this is really just to talk to you a little bit about uh, concepts, ideas that we have for possibly restructuring the cost of that facility, one of the ideas that uh, was brought up was looking at a tiered pricing model. Um, the numbers that you have before you aren't necessarily set in stone, but it at least gives you the idea of what we're looking at, where we would have a certain amount of money. Are, uh, basically, it's a, the more you use the facility, the, the bigger discount that you receive. So it's a, a volume discount, if you will. But under this tiered pricing proposal, what would happen is we would look at the first 160 days. And why did we settle on 160 days? Well, right now we're utilizing the facility about 140 days every single year. So we believe, it's our belief, that once the facility expands to a full field, there will be a lot more demand for the use of that. And so we upped it to a, a minimum of 160 on that first tier. In that first tier, we'd pay roughly $200 per hour for the use of that facility. The second tier down for a period of roughly 20 days, it would reduce to 190, and then beyond that, it would reduce down to 180. Again, these numbers are not locked in stone, but this is a model that we're currently discussing with the, the owners of the Sportsplex and wanted to get the board's uh, input on whether or not this seems like a, a structure that would work for the board. What's our current contract? Our current contract is just indicates that we pay $200 every day we use it. So there's no sort of price break at any point. Right, but is it, do we have a number of days specified? Well, it indicates right now 180 days. But, you know, that's not a cap, so to speak. So we would be able to utilize it more if we needed to. You said $200 per day. Did you mean hour? It's really $200 per day. I'm sorry. Per hour. Per hour. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Yeah. So it's $200 per hour. And really when we're talking about days, we utilize the facility. It's about three hours a day. So you're, you've got 200 dollars an hour for so many days and all you're doing is trying to extend the number of days but keep the cost similar or yeah or reduce it yeah if, I, if we're already committed to it and you're trying to be creative in reducing costs but at the same time increase our ability to use the fields i can't see that as being a bad thing personally are we currently paying 200 dollars an hour or 100 dollars an hour Currently, we only pay 100 because it's just a half field. Under the, under the old contract, it goes up to $200 per hour uh, once it becomes a full football field facility. 
And that's the current agreement. That's the current agreement. So I don't, I don't see there was any issue. If you can get more time at less cost, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I think uh, we talked about this in the uh, finance committee about um, you know whether we go with a guaranteed monthly rate or we go with a you know uh, if we use it so many days we get this tiered approach. I know Pat, you had some ideas on the way to go, and then the other big thing was you know, if we're going to try to increase the days we use the facility, that we could do things that bring in revenue to help pay and to do, provide programs to the district, to the students, maybe even to the community. And he, the owner of the facility, said that he would allow us to, to uh, I think is what he told you, right? Yeah, he absolutely did. So he, he's been very uh, creative about that and saying that if we utilize the facility, you know, for a tournament or something like that that's a revenue-generating uh, event that we would be able to keep that revenue to offset our costs of use for the use of that facility. I don't know. Did you have anything on this, Pat? No. Oh, okay. um, I see the, the... So you're saying on the, the difference of... I guess I'm trying to figure out what we're, what we're doing here. <laughs> They are we looking at any kind of a guarantee to them, or are we just well, like I said, I mean, tell this them is, we're going to get a better deal of by days that we're using it. I guess I because I, I, I thought that when we talked about this before, that we were looking at some kind of a guarantee that he was going to want. No, well, we think we think we will use it 160. And okay. I think, so I think that's kind of the underlying guarantee is that we believe we will use it based on prior usage at 140. Plus, we think when, once it's expanded to a full field that there will be more usage. It just makes sense that, you know, different teams will be able to play inside and, you know, have a full football field or a full soccer field to utilize the facility. So we think it will be used more. Yeah, but that, so if we use it the 160 and we guarantee them the $200 an hour, that's 96 grand a year. That we're, I guess what I'm saying is if we're going to guarantee him 96 grand a year, that should give us a deal, and better than the savings here of $4,000. I agree. So again, so, this isn't a final deal. We're just trying to understand if this is something that the board is interested in. If this structure makes sense, should we continue to pursue this? I guess I would, I'd be willing, and depending on what the rest of the board wants, is if, uh, if we said uh, the 160 days and if we guaranteed him the 96,000 that he, we come up with, I don't know what it is, but how many days extra do we think we should get based off of gearing him? Because right now it seems like the billing and stuff is, is kind of all over the board and what we're using it and what we're paying them. I know that that's been an issue before is – what do we feel if we're going to guarantee someone, a business owner, this much a year, how many extra days should we get? I think it should be more than 4,000. And then we can, then once we have it, we could go talk to the, our groups and say, hey, let's use this facility and let's generate some revenue so that we can help pay for what we're, what we're doing. I think once it becomes a full football field, that's going to be a heck of an advantage for, uh, for the district, for the football team, for the band, for everybody. So I don't know, is there anybody? Yeah, what, what the current plan he has before you is okay. we're, we're playing, when he does the addition, we're going to pay $200 an hour. That's already in the contract. Okay. So what we're saying is we know once it goes to a full-size field, um, the usage is, is going to increase. So the idea that we use it 140 and what Todd's saying to you, we believe we'd use it 160 because we want to lock our time in and not have someone else take our time. Where you know, let's say your soccer, your your football team, lacrosse, whatever, wanted to go over and use it, we want to lock up the time so those teams can go use it. Then after the 160, what Todd is saying that we're getting the we're going to get a discount on the hourly cost. We're going to pay less than. 
the two hundred dollars, and then once we go over at one eighty, we're going to pay we're going to pay even less than that. So the more we use it, the less we pay. So I just want to clarify because I think to me it was confusing at first, and so I can't imagine what it sounds like to everybody else without this paper in front of them. But from what I understand, you're saying is. At this point, we are for sure using the facility 140 days. We pay $100 an hour for half a field. Our current contract says we will go up to $200 an hour when it's a full field. We're already committed to that. But based on our actual usage, we're really using it 160 days, which is really like $96,000. So what this tiered pricing is saying is that after if we're saying, you know, we're pretty sure we're going to use it 160 days, which comes out to the $96,000, but for additional days beyond that, we would tier the pricing down to be less than $200 per hour, depending on how many extra days there is. You know, it's more of a discount the more days it gets used. So ultimately, it, to me, it doesn't sound like it's changing anything that we've already agreed to. In fact, it would only help us in terms of payment because based on our real usage of this field <clears throat> if we if we end up going over even more we're only going to give a savings to ourselves in the end of the day correct yeah, yeah and I just I yes you're right Lisa I just wanted to I wanted to add that like you know right now um, if you use it if we said we're just going to use it the same amount we are now we does that addition you'd be spending 84,000 that's already set. You'd be spending 84, 84000 because there's already agreement once it becomes a full-size field. Yeah, and the other piece that I just want to make very clear is, you know, I think Leonard's touched on this, but I want to make it very clear, is our concern is that once it becomes a full field, if you have other districts, other groups, other clubs coming in and scheduling that full field, we don't want to get locked out. All right, so what do you need from us tonight? Nothing? Just appreciate your input and wanted to brief the board on kind of what we're doing and make sure the structure makes sense. All right. Well, we've thoroughly probably confused everybody out there for, uh, for that, but thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, bills payable. Robin. We have the bills payable for January 2020. At this time, does the board have any questions regarding that check detail? Any questions from the board? Seeing none. We can go back to, is there a motion to accept the bills payable for January 2020 as presented? Yeah, I'll make so, the motion. Support. Motion to be made and supported. Uh, vote by roll. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Billstadt? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Drew? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kenward and Joe, are you coming up for a field trip too? All right. So in front of you, we are pretty excited. We've been working on this for a while. So in front of you, you have an agreement between Anchor Bay Schools and our Construction Trades Program and Habitat for Humanity. And what um, we need signature on is our high school students will be building 18 walls for a house for Habitat of Humanity um, starting um, in March. So we just need board approval for that. We're pretty excited about that. This is gonna be a three-year plan. We're hoping next year to do more partnerships, and then the following year, maybe look at building a house with them. Yeah, I think this is, this is great to hear, great that we're doing this with the construction and to, to have that, that uh, ultimate plan of building our own house with our own program with every trade is, is awesome. I don't, anybody got? I thought I read, was the, um, 
The house is in district too, right? So right now all we're doing is building the walls for a house that Habitat has chosen. Okay. Blue Water. Is that house in district? No, not yet. We're working on that. I think the goal, I think the goal is what we do own lots throughout the school district. The goal was many years ago in our building trades class was to construct homes in subdivisions within the school district. So the district does own lots um, throughout the school district to do that in the future. And with the program, we've just, we tried to build up to that. And there's a few times we had some outstanding instructors and, um, and they're hard to, to find in the building trades. And we think we have a great one now. So we're back on track to eventually, uh, you know, build a home. Um, this, and all of the all of the construction materials will be paid for by Habitat for Humanity. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And the one nice thing about this project is once we build the walls, our students will actually be able to go on site and observe and learn even more uh, hands-on experiences with this partnership. They're going to go work with the carpenters on site. Yes, eventually. Nice. So we're so responsible. Uh, for whose teacher salary? Are we? She's. Are we? The, the building trades teachers' salary when they're out there. Are you talking about when they go out? Yeah. It, during the school, out during school time. Okay. Um, so we're looking for a motion to approve the construction agreement between Anchor Bay School District and the Blue Water Habitat for Humanity as presented. I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Moses. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Middlestad. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, now we go to Joe. You don't got anything? I do. I, I, I'm here I, I, a field trip. I thought um, Sherry had one as well, but. Um, she went in front of you. That's okay. She went out of turn. No. It's okay. Um, yeah, but I am here uh, on behalf of our uh, high school band uh, directors. Um, to ask for permission uh, to approve a biannual trip to Orlando, Florida. Um, this is a trip that they've done many times in the past, and they alternate between Florida and New York, uh, try to give uh, it one trip every four years, or every two years, so that each location is given in a four-year span. Um, when they go to Orlando, they do um, go to Disney. They used a use a, a Disney partner um, a company to help plan the trip that has a good reputation. While they're there, they do um, partake in clinics and perform at uh, Walt Disney World. They, they are also in a, a parade there. The trip would require them, the staff and the students, to be excused from two days from school. Um, so I'm here um, on their behalf asking for approval. Also, this trip is uh, a year in advance because of a trip to Florida. Uh, it would be May 19, uh, 19 through the 23rd of 2021. All right. Is there any discussion from the board on this? Mr. McDonald, is any of the costs bore by the district or is it all through fundraising? and Fundraising and the booster club, the band boosters, supported a lot. All right. Uh, we're looking for a motion to approve for planning and implementation of teacher initiated school field trip to Orlando, Florida from May 19th through May 23rd, 2021 as presented. I'll make the motion. Motion by Mr. Moses. I'll second. Second by Ms. Berkmeyer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those, those opposed? opposed? Motion passes. Union communication. Julie. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, I'm not quite sure where to start, but earlier today, um, Mr. Rathbun gave a presentation about teacher negotiations, and while we appreciate the effort at transparency, it would have been even more appreciated had the ABEA been a part of those discussions, especially as Jamie mentioned earlier, we were just at Central yesterday. So I can't imagine that from 4 o'clock yesterday to today this was all put into place and no one could give us a heads up. But um, if you will, I'd like to 
go over a couple of points that I think are important and were missed during that presentation. First of all, the ABEA started negotiating in March of 2019. So we now have been doing this for 11 months. Um, on the website, from what I could see, the proposal started in August, which is a little bit misleading because by that point we have been negotiating for five months. Also, Mr. Rathbun pointed out that our first proposal asked for 5% on schedule. And he is correct. I'm not, no one's disagreeing that with, with that fact. Um, the negotiating team, which I'm a part of, was given no parameters. So we were essentially negotiating against ourselves. Other districts are given a pot of money or a dollar amount. This is what we have to work with. And then, as a negotiating team, they figure out how they want to best spend that money. The last two years I've been on the negotiating team, and Anchor Bay has never provided us with a dollar amount like that or something to work with. So we have no idea where to start. Um, I think that's important when you look at a 5% on schedule proposal. It wasn't that we were trying to be outrageous with what we were asking for, but we truly had no starting ground, no starting point with what to negotiate. Second, it was brought up that we agreed to wait until the state budget had passed to negotiate the top step. That is accurate. We sat at the negotiating table with the school board president who promised us that nobody, no contract, no unit in all of Anchor Bay would settle anything until that budget came in. So we agreed to wait. We agreed to settle everything but that top step because we were going to wait. Unbeknownst to us, in the meantime, all the other units settled, including their top step and the teachers are here still waiting. Another one of the slides pointed out that the top step received 2% in 1718 and 2% in 1819. That is accurate. Unfortunately, that slide showed a 10-year span. If you had gone back one more year to the 11th year, you would have realized that those people at the top step took three furlough days. So they took a 1.5% pay cut that year. So yes, they did get back 2%, another 2%, but I think it's important to point out that they lost 1.5% 11 years ago off of that salary schedule. Another slide picked a teacher who was frozen. I believe it was at step five, which is very similar to my situation. I was frozen at step six. When those steps were restored, that teacher received a $22,000 increase over the, those, uh, I think it was two or three years those steps were restored. I don't disagree with that. But again, it was not pointed out that that same teacher lost close to $100,000 in salary over the six years they were frozen. Both points are important. They did receive a huge increase that they worked for many years without getting. Um, and finally, I'm going to wrap up with the ABEA's last proposal that was pushed across the table is 1% different than the district's last proposal that they pushed across. The biggest difference is it's on schedule money. By giving your teachers on schedule money, you are treating them with respect and showing them that you will include them in their budget year after year. And that is such a huge, important thing. 1% on schedule is much more meaningful than a 2% off schedule stipend. Thank you. All right, a lot has been said about me tonight and things I've said, but I'll, I'll wait for that till board comments. So we'll, we'll go to the planning for the future. Uh, what do we got first? The bus purchases and lease. Are you doing that, Todd? Yes. Uh, I want, you know, we've shared a lot of financial information with the board tonight, and so this might come as uh, a bit of a surprise to the board that we're coming and asking to lease to purchase an additional eight buses. But when, if you've had an opportunity to look at the motion before you, there's some detail in there. I will uh, supplement that a little bit here tonight um, before you uh, bring the motion to the board. We have a number of buses in our fleet that are significantly aged. Uh, Trustee Green was kind enough to tell me that the uh, average life of a bus is 12 years. We have 13, uh, I'm sorry, 16 buses that are 13 years or older in our current fleet. We are incurring significant amounts of cost to keep these older buses running. We have spent 
significant amount of money over the past several years. In fact, last year we spent uh, $155,000 to repair four of our older buses. This year, we've already spent over $310,000 and are also poised to spend roughly $150,000 on three or four of our oldest buses. The eight buses that we propose to lease would replace eight of our oldest buses that have not yet been repaired. We had the mechanics go out and take a look at those eight old buses and try and provide us with an idea of what it might cost to keep those buses running, make them uh, sufficiently safe, and uh, meet all of the requirements for the Michigan State Police inspection that's done every year. They estimated that the cost for those eight buses over the next several years was going to run roughly $140,000 for this year and then another $146,000 the following year. If we were to go enter into a lease arrangement, we could essentially lease the eight buses for a price of approximately $140,000 a year for the next six years which would essentially alleviate us from having to pay the $140,000 each year for the next several years to keep our older buses running. So although this won't save the district any money, what it will do is it'll essentially replace old buses with new buses that we will not necessarily have to pay repair costs for even though we will have to pay the lease. So we're kind of subbing out lease costs to have eight new buses or expense costs that we're paying to repair very old buses that you know you never know when a bus that's 17 years old is going to go. So we, we're just trying to make sure we don't throw good money after bad and we believe that this lease is makes the most sense financially for the district at this time. Is there any dis... Ooh, I think I lost it. Any discussion? Just do we own these buses at the end of the lease? Or? Yeah, it's a great, great question. It is a capital lease, so at the end of the lease, we would own the buses. And we're not responsible for any repairs during the eight years that we're leasing? Yeah, we would be. But, the, you know, obviously the repair costs on a brand new bus would be significantly less. Any other discussion? I, you want to do the motion first or discuss yes, first? I can, I'll read you want to read it? Uh, it's, yeah, I'll read it. I don't think that's working anymore. Can you all hear me? I think you can. All right. The proposal before you is to enter into a capital lease agreement. Oh, is that the motion? Just jump to the I'll jump to the bottom. Which one? The last paragraph, you think? Yeah. To continue to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair buses beyond their useful life is not fiscally responsible. The better solution is to spend the money to purchase new buses and thereby avoid the cost of repair of the old buses. As it turns out, the proposed cost of the lease for the eight buses is nearly the same as the annual cost of repairing these old buses. As such, the transaction becomes cost neutral to the district. Rather than paying 140,000 repairs each year, the district will pay 140,000 for the next six years to purchase eight new buses. It is my recommendation that you authorize the district to pursue and enter into a capital lease to purchase eight new buses. I would make a motion to authorize the superintendent or his designee to enter into a capital lease arrangement for the purchase of eight new buses. Uh, so that's the motion. Anybody want to make it? I will make that motion. Motion by Green. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded, Seconded by, by Moses. Any discussion? So fundamentally, since I've been on the board, we've done bond issues because general fund money is precious. Capital expenses, whether it's for buses, buildings, major repairs. And this is just, I know it's revenue neutral, but the $840,000, if we had purchased buses in a bond issue, wouldn't have been money spent on a general fund. You're spending over three quarters of a million dollars that didn't need to be spent if we had done the bond issue. We, this, ironically, it's been. We've had a bond issue continuously, and Andy knows this quite well, it's for 30 years. This is the first year in 30 years that we haven't done a bond issue. Now we're going to run into bus purchases, 
we're going to run into re major repairs. We talk about structural, structural issues with the budget. We haven't had to have major budget allocated for major repairs of this district in 30 years. Next year, we'll have to do those things. So my question, my concern was, is it's $840,000 out of general fund. Now I asked the administration, if we did a bond issue, and which we should do in the near future, do we need to spend that 840000 or can be rolled into a bond issue as a purchase? And the answer is? Yes, um, the answer is yes. Uh, we will, I talked with our attorney at Troon. We would have the ability, we would have to structure the deal in a certain way to effectuate what you're asking. But we could do that um, such that if we did pass a bond down the road, we could use those proceeds to essentially pay off the lease. Well, you know, that's, I'm, again, it's been one of the things, my pet peeves district-wise, that fundamentally I'd be against this. But if you're saying if we do a bondage fairly quickly and be able to compensate and pay for those, I guess I would, I won't disagree with it, but fundamentally spending money on buses in the first time in 30 years out of general fund is just, it's just, it's just terrible. It's just. Is there any other discussion? So, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would, I will vote for this, but I would like to see us start working on a bond issue pretty quick. Yeah, we can uh, definitely take a look at that and probably have a committee set up to look at that. Um, is there any discussion on the current bus? Lease proposal, Mr. Green. Todd, I don't have my calculator. My phone died. It looks like at the end of six years, if my math is right by hand, we're going to pay roughly 105,000 per bus. Is that correct? Uh, it's a mixture. So, I mean, that's probably the average. We're we're purchasing four 77 passenger buses, which run a little bit less than that. They're closer to around ninety thousand dollars, and then we're also purchasing. A few uh, 89 passenger buses, I believe, and uh, those are closer to I want to say 115,000 for those buses, and and where we're getting that pricing is right off the this you know this state negotiated contract through uh, Holland Bus. When will you get the buses? Will they be in in time for the inspection? Um, that's yeah. W is, if the board decides tonight to go forward, um, Mary is in the uh, <laughs> in the audience. Uh, I will be contacting her first thing in the morning, and we will be getting in contact with Holland Bus to start production. Mary, if you don't mind, when is your inspection scheduled? When is it normally? Well, you never know. Various state police have to do it on location. This year. Okay, so it's like it's likely they're not going to come back until August, September of, of this year. Okay, and they have to be inspected during the school year, correct? Yeah, in my conversations, they thought six months would be enough to get the buses to us before the inspection. Thank you. All right, any other discussion? We'll vote by roll. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Ms. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Daru? Yes. Motion passes. We got an authorization request from Mr. Case and Mr. Dombro. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Daru. Uh, in your board packet is a change authorization for the 2017 bond issue. It has a total value of $27,737.61. And Mr. Dombro, our senior Project manager from Bart Mal is here to answer any questions you might have. I move that we approve the change order as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. How much is it? 27. Is, uh, is there any discussion? <coughs> Mr. Case, how much money do you have left in your 10% your uh, excess plan? Well, as you, uh, the Finance Committee met, and um, <laughs> I'm working with uh, uh, Todd, uh, I'm working in uh, Robin to make sure those numbers are accurate. So. At this time, I'd, I'd like to uh, defer. We were going to have that at our next finance committee meeting, Correct. right? To talk about what's left and what we could do with that possible. Sure. A plan. A plan. Yep. Thank you, sir. We will buy buses. Maybe. 
All right, vote by roll. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Witt? Yes. Mr. Middlestat? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Kirk Meyer? Yes. Mr. DeRue? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. All right, now I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. It's the minutes of the regular meeting of January 22nd, 2020, the special meeting of February 12th, 2020, and the financial report as presented. I'll make the motion. Motion by Mr. Moses. Is there a second? I'll support. Supported by Mr. Green. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All right. All those motion passes. We're at our second uh, option for public comment. If anybody that's left wants to come on up. All right. Mrs. Richards. He's further down. Okay, can you guys hear me? Stephanie Richards, 9980 Arnold Road. Uh, only thing I'd like to say is if we could get the superintendent using the microphone correctly, nobody could hear him tonight, almost any time he spoke. So everybody else using the microphone did a great job, but it, it just, you know, that'd be great for us. I, I, you know, I didn't hear the ROTC changes, um, anything like that that I was interested in. All right, well, uh, when you do your superintendent thing, use the microphone. Thank you. Yep, uh, even though they're all not working. Uh, any other public comment? All right. We'll go to superintendent. That one works. Turn it down. Well, you're kind of in the corner there, so. Is this one on? There you go. There it goes. So what I wanted to share was, uh, you know, February, our governor, Governor Whitmer, declared uh, February as a career and technical education month in Michigan. Career and technical education provides students with an opportunity to learn skills needed or an in-demand careers in a variety of fields, prepares students to becoming lifelong learners. We are extremely proud of our 16 state approved programs here at Anchor Bay. We have award winning students in HOSA, DECA, BPA, both at the state and national levels. Our programs provide students with options to continue after high school and earn college credit. And each program has at least two articulation agreements where our students can get a free credit um, from three to 12 credits for college. Over 200 students participated in 10 field trips to uh, trips on Manufacturing Day this past October. We have had two new college-bound CTE programs, um, cybersecurity and computer programming and engineering. We have also expanded two after-school CTE clubs, eSport and our first robotics. Our biggest event is coming up on March 9th. It is our career fair with over 140 employers are going to be represented. So hopefully uh, you're able to make it out on March 19th um, to Anchor Bay High School. It's a great event. Thank you. All right. You did better. We'll go to board comments. Mr. Middlestat. I defer. Uh, Mr. Green. I have two things, Mr. President. Uh, one, I was at the high school on Saturday for the penny auction for the JROTC. Uh, I was really impressed by the passion of the MC, uh, and as well as the kids' participation. They seemed to be having a good time, even though uh, it was a little warm in there. But the, the attendance, I, I don't know what the exact number was, but there were significantly more people there than I expected to see. Uh, and the only other thing I have is Monday uh, over at Little Camille's. You can come over and have pizza with a cop in New Baltimore. Uh, I think it's 20 bucks for adults, 10 bucks for kids. So if you're in the neighborhood looking for pizza, uh, Little Camille's is normally closed on Monday, and I know that they've invited the uh, New Baltimore Police Officers Association to come in uh, and do a fundraiser to help buy some additional equipment for the officers there, um, probably to outfit their brand-new car that they just bought. So uh, that's it, sir. Uh, Ms. Berkmeyer? 
Um, I just had a couple things. Um, I, I don't think he's here anymore, but um, I got to meet the president of the Band Boosters at the Taste Fest that they held um, at the high school. It was an amazing event. Um, I, they really outdid themselves. Um, the, the amount of people that they had there and the amount of um, restaurants and vendors was great. Um, I brought my first grader who I think he ate more in that day than I've seen him eat in a week. Um, so it was it was kid approved um, and to congratulations on the band on all their accomplishments um, there were an extremely large number of them um, I think we're all proud of them um, and that's about it Ms. DeWitt I'd just like to again acknowledge our teachers of the year um, I believe that they represent and it's unfortunate that we can't have many many at every level every year but I do believe that they represent all of the fine educators in the district. So in acknowledging them, we actually are acknowledging all of our teachers and appreciate everything they do for our kids. Mr. Moses? Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to all the teachers out there for uh, coming and uh, speaking their mind. It's uh, things everybody needs to hear. Um, I believe uh, I'm going to have to take it upon myself to work with everybody here to uh to go after the state and try to get us some more money um i don't think there's a person up here that doesn't believe you guys are worth more than what you're paid but we're gonna have to go get it um that being said i'd like to congratulate the uh the teachers of the year um i'd like to say a thank you to mr sletsky for putting on a good presentation and i'd like to compliment our choral program or our uh, choir program for the choral festival we had 130 kids get top ratings or something like that i don't remember the numbers but they, they brought in a, a judge from outside to, uh, to measure them, and uh, they, they did an excellent job. And our uh, early childhood or early elementary um, honors choir, we got a third, fourth, and fifth grade choir going right now, and uh, we got over 160 kids involved. I think that's uh, pretty fantastic. So that's it for me. All right. Uh, I do want to congratulate the three. Uh, Teachers of the Year, that was, that's awesome. It's always a great thing to do each year. Uh, Mr. Seleski, thank you for uh, accommodating us and for the presentation and seeing, like I said, since we've been doing this and seeing it, you know, going back to the kids right at the beginning of the meeting, that's, I enjoy that. I think it's, it's, it's great. I know the rest of the board does. Um, I'm probably going to talk too much because I, I tend to do that, but I got to address, I mean, my name was brought up quite a bit tonight. I know... I can be polarizing at times, but uh, when it comes to the contract, I inserted myself in there heavily this, as a new board member. You know, many know that I'm a union rep outside of this. That's what I do for a living. I'm a financial secretary for a plumber's union, 100% union, 100% behind the teachers. I want to do all I can for them. You know, it was said tonight by one that I was at a table with people talking about hostile work environment. Yes, I was at those tables. I don't remember saying last meeting that I'd never heard of it. I did. And every issue that has been brought to me, I've brought to the forefront if, it was, if the person wanted me to. Or if there was a way, I know as a union rep representing people, you only bring it to, say, Superintendent Woodside, if that person doesn't want to know, you only bring it to him if he can't know who it is by just by you talking I mean, there's ways to do this. So I do know that, and I've taken everything that I've heard seriously. You know, another said, I'm watching Facebook. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do. I watch it in my local to get the pulse of what's going on. I try to get the pulse of what parents and possibly teachers and what people are saying. I don't get in arguments on there because you're not going to solve anything on Facebook. I've put my number out there. I've put my name out there. Many have contacted me. Many have met with me, and they don't want to be known, and no one will ever know who I met with, who I didn't meet with, if they don't want to be known. You know, but I'm always going to get, try to get to the bottom of things. When it comes to the contract, I just, and Leonard and Todd stop me if I'm getting to anything that can get us in an unfair labor practice or, or any kind of that, but I was at the table, and I was in good graces with a lot of people when things were going good. And 
I think the rest of the members up here would, would agree that I was single-handedly spearheaded the effort to try to get you guys a contract prior to the state budget. I understood what you were saying. Many up here supported it. I'm not, that's not to take away from people supporting it, but I was talking to every board member I could. I was trying to understand the contract. That's why I sat at the table. And it made sense to me for you to know what you're getting paid prior to you starting a school year and not being able to get retro pay. It made sense to me. Many up here were telling me not to do it. They're telling us not to do it. The administration told us, do not do this. Do not do this. But if you're going to do it, because they knew we were, there was at least four of us with our minds made up to do it, and it surprised you who the four were, I'm sure. But we go and do that, and we, at the time of whose idea was it for to leave the top step off, I'm not going to get into personal conversations and into table talk and this and that, but I, I, I don't think you can, I know for a fact you can't rest that solely on, on the district. And because the district didn't want to do anything. And I didn't know school negotiations. I know as, as a union negotiator for the plumbers, I know what to do to go into negotiations. And, and, and if I think my contractors can give my men a raise, I go in there prepared and I tell them why I think they can charge more out in the private sector and why they can charge more to give my guys more money. And that's what we do. And I ask the same out of you guys. And, and the difference here is we have a... We have a for all intents and purposes, you have a set amount of money of what you can pay. So we go and do that, and we give the, as a board, we, we, we give the, the, the bottom step, or the, the not the bottom step, the step, the step teachers, those on steps, a full step, full longevity. That's already settled. We can talk about that. I, we gave them the prep time. I fought hard for that in the room. I think that the teachers, I think union leadership, would agree that I fought hard that last day to get you guys everything that, that I could. Hell, I wanted release time for the president. I think it's worthwhile. I'll say it publicly. The subbing, the, the uh, there was multiple other, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, I think when they had to sub and they got paid and in multiple other things. And, and when we talked about holding off the top step and stop me if I'm going to get crazy, but we said, and it was said, this, anything we do with the contract and by pushing this off could affect what we are able to give the top step. And, and you said tonight that I said at the table we weren't going to settle with the rest of the groups. I, I, again, I got messed up by calling some people a liar up here. I'm not going to call people a liar, but I honestly don't remember ever saying that. Because I'm a union guy, I'm going to fight for every group. And I want every group to get raises and good raises. And I think that them getting 5%, our, our, our staff, our other 500 people that work for this district, to raise them up, and when I looked at their wages, I mean, these two go nuts when I meet with them almost every other day down here. I tell them I want Anchor Bay to be a minimum $15 an hour district. See? He goes nuts. I know it's not feasible, but it's, it's what I would strive for this district to do. So anyways, to get to where we're at now, and I know I get long-winded, but I, I just, I really, it's really bothering me, and I could use this time to say this, is as a guy who fights for working men and women every day of my life, that's what I do, that's what I built a career on, and to be said out there that I'm not for teachers, I'm for a fiscally responsible budget here at the district. And what we did with those, those, the first contract, and when Todd and Leonard show me that we're at, we're going to finish the year at 2.6% fund balance. And then we're going to end the next year at 1.8. And some of these people up here, Mr. Middlestat, Mr. Witt, Ms. Acavetti have, you know, guys, people that have been seasoned up here have told me what that means and going below the 5%. And I know some say it's just extra paperwork, but, you know, you send me to these trainings, 
and they say you go below 5%, you get on watch from the state. We're projected, if we don't get the enhancement millage, and we, what we currently offer, so we can say we're currently offering 2% off scale to the top step teachers, with that, we're going down. I think next year we would be uh, in deficit for our fund balance, correct? So, and what I've said to union leadership, and I'll say it again tonight, and I don't want to use people's names, but she said that she would sit and work with anybody. I've, they have, you guys have all the numbers. You have everything. If we have the money, I don't think there's anybody up here that wouldn't give it to you. I want to. I'd love to give you guys the 5% you asked for. Sold. I'll do it tomorrow. But if I'm looking at a budget that is going to take us down, and then what I'm being told is myself as a pro board president and the superintendent got to go to Lansing and go tell them how we're going to get out of, out of this deficit. And you know what everybody's telling me, and I've talked to other districts and everything, it means laying off teachers. Because you're 85%, what is it? I know Anita tells me it's 85%, sorry to use your name, but it's 85%, 85 cents on every dollar. Yeah, 85 cents on the dollar goes to labor. So what sense does it make to go crazy? I mean, even the 2%. And then the, the recent of 1% to the, you know, next year, that's all stuff that was, yeah, that if the enhancement millage passes, even that they're telling us we shouldn't do it. But we want to be good to everybody in this district. And that, that's all, I mean, I just, and when it comes to the other groups, yeah, I, I don't like, I don't want groups being pit against each other. But because they got 5%, that, the top step teachers shouldn't be mad. It's all about everybody. But that's what I'm getting, back to me. And, I, and I, you and I can talk after this meeting, and I can tell you what's coming to me. And it's about bringing everybody up. It's the union movement as a whole, in my opinion. This is John DeRoop speaking personally. But I will do all I can within the confines of this. And if you can show me where the budget they're giving me is wrong or giving us is wrong, we can have another talk. And then another thing, and I don't know, you and I talked about it, this evaluation. It was my first one. And I can be man enough up here to sit and tell you that I didn't really know. I think others up here could admit that. Didn't really know how to do it. Just got trained on it a week prior. Went through it. Did the best I could. And if you're, we had talked briefly about others. I know there's a lot saying that over this consensus in this majority vote. But as the board president, I had those numbers. I had what people vote. I had what that turned out to if you didn't do it just by a majority vote. And Leonard holds the rights to me putting anything out there, but are you good with me? He still comes out highly effective. Even with the way that the votes went down. Even with you do it by, the, by using the numbers of what it you know, all the, of uh, taking this, the seven people on the board and dividing it and doing all that, doing all the numbers, he goes from a 40 to a 36. Still highly effective. So I think the board members coming out after we talked about the fact that we were going to, the vote that we took out here was to solidify what we just did in there. It wasn't to say whether you thought he was highly effective or not. It was to solidify that the process was done in the correct manner and that we did what we needed to do and, and, and we didn't lie or cheat or do anything bad back there. That was a political move. That was a ploy. That was to say I'm better than someone else. We did it the right way. And I'm not into the games. I'm into talking to anybody straight forth, straight forward. And anybody that wants to meet me at any time, I'll meet you. I talked to my buddy, and he probably wouldn't, he's on the New Baltimore City Council. They're going through some stuff. He started coffee hours for him. It's unheard of in, in New Baltimore City Council. Him and I are meeting this weekend, and I'm probably going to start him for this. Because I am not afraid to talk to anybody about anything. And I'll tell you why I make the decisions, and that's what I did say last meeting. Because we're elected officials. 
we stand up here, we do this for, basically for volunteer, but I'm not going to railroad somebody because someone told me to, and I'm not going to out just to spend money freely because I'm a union guy. Because I'm a union guy, I did what I did and probably put the district in some harm's way, but we can get out of it, and, we, and I just don't think we should go any further. So anyways, I, I hope I didn't go on too long. I just, a lot of things have been bothering me, when, especially when people are putting some of the stuff they're putting out there. Um, Motion to go into closed session, sir. Well, yeah. We can read it first, because you got to. I think that's what they tell me. I'm a rule follower. Where'd it go? All right. We need a motion to go into closed session to convene to discuss labor negotiations pursuant to 8C Open Meetings Act. It requires a two-thirds vote. Is there a motion? By, May, by Mr. Green, is there a second? I'll second. Vote by roll. Yeah. Understood. Mr. Green. Yes. Ms. DeWitt. Yes. Mr. Middlestat. Yes. Mr. Moses. Yes. Berkmeyer, yes. Daru. Yes. Need a motion to end closed session? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make the motion. Motion. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> motion to made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. We stand adjourned to the next regular meeting. I was like, what in the world?